So last time we have covered up to page five and we finished the first two paragraphs up to the word Sukhavati. The word Sukhavati on page five. So uh, we should continue from there. So we should remember Sukhavati means the land of the, the land of bliss, the land of happiness. And some people call it the heaven. Um, in the practice of Buddhism, there's so many methods. The Buddhism is not just rely on faith alone, not just rely on faith. It relies, in addition to faith, it relies on your practice. You have to practice it. On the one hand, it has the theory. On the other hand, it has to practice. Theory has to, and practice has to go to, have to go together. Um, when we are doing meditation, it is entirely on our own efforts uh, to practice our mind. Um, and then this sutra concentrates on not just your own practice, this sutra concentrates on also reliance on others, on that is something that is outside your mind, um, which is the, the power and the vow of Amitabha Buddha. So you have to see the difference. Many religions emphasize on going to heaven after death. And the Buddhist faith, the Buddhist religion, emphasizes not just on going to heaven after death, it also emphasizes on how do you practice when you are living, not just after death. So in order to, be, to make sure that in your next life, you don't roll into, next, into the samsara of life and death again. So, Sakamuni Buddha uh, told us that at the junction of death, you can be reborn into the land of bliss, which is the land of Amitabha Buddha. So, this is the lecture all about, uh, if we want to call it, the heaven concept of Buddhism. There's so many ways in the practice of Buddhism. For example, in meditation, why do we meditate? Meditate is to understand your own mind. In, our, in, in, in all our behavior, in our speech, we've been using our mind. So it's, it's the most important is not, not just to say, oh God, give me help. God, give me this. God, give me that. You have to rely on yourself. You have, to, you have to train your mind in such a way that your mind becomes powerful to control your own mental afflictions. And generally speaking, the, the Buddhist teaching says that the mind is generally speaking in two parts. Or we can say in three parts. The mind is in three parts. The one part is perception. Uh, the, our eyes, our ears, our nose, our tongue, our eyes see, our ears listen, our nose, we breathe fragrance, air, the tongue, taste, and the body is touch. So these are the perception, the perceptible mind. Other than the perceptible mind, we also have the, what we call the polluted emotion mind, emotional mind. And then there's a third, which is the pure thinking, the thinking mind, which is the, the mano. So whenever our perception react, reacts to the outside world, what happens? When, when, our, when our senses, our six senses, react to the outside world, what happens? There's a reaction. It's not a response, it's a reaction. Reaction is emotional, you know. A response is a thought out, uh, a thought out logical thinking to deal with the environment. But 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 a reaction is not. A reaction is emotional. When you yell at me, when you're angry with me, I angry get angry with you. There's emotion. I have depression. There's emotion. I have fear. I have anxiety. I have jealousy. I have hatred. I have all this kind of reaction. This is reaction. Reaction is without reason. You just react to it according to the circumstances. You are not responding to it, though. 
a response is a thought or reasoning. But you, usually, usually when you advise people, hey, John, don't be emotional. Don't react to it, but try to respond to it. Just respond with reason. But how many people, when you're, when you're confronted with one part is the emotion, the other part, the other part is reasoning, is usually, usually the emotions would win. Emotional emotion would win over the reasoning. Why? Because our mind has been polluted from many, many lives ago. You, you react to it. You don't respond to it logically and reasonably. So, because our senses react to all these environments through our senses, and now meditation says, don't go outside. You look at inside, because you're, what's outside, you, should, you react from the in, inside, you react to the outside without reason. Now, when you want to look at what happened to this reaction, analyze it, tackle it, control it, change it, improve it, you, you have to go inside. So all these meditation, you rely on yourself to meditate. You need meditation every day. But nowadays, people are so busy. How many, how many hours of meditation you put to the time of meditation? If you can meditate for one hour per day, to some people, it's extremely good already. If you meditate one hour per day, some people don't even meditate. Some people may, may come to the temple on a Saturday morning, they meditate for another one hour, and then that's it. So we all study this, we look inward. When we look inward, what do we do? When we look inward, we look at our own mind. We understand how our mind reacts. And then we can say, hey, mind, don't react like that. Don't be jealous. Don't create hatred. Don't create violence. Don't create je depression. Uh, fear, anxiety, don't create all these. These are no good for you. But how many people sit back and, <laughs> and meditate and do something about that? How many people perform this introversion of attention to your own mind, to purify your own mind? Maybe one, one out of uh, 10,000, 100,000? You're different. You explore that area. This is the first step. But some people just take that first step and then back, step back again to life and death. You don't, you don't take what the first step, you go, it's very important to take that first step. It's like in a triath triathlon. It's so long away, but if you, if you stride out that first step, you continue, you continue, continue, and then you go into the destination. Now that is on relying on yourself to purify your mind, to get to nirvana, to get enlightened. But given that we're so busy, we all have this hustle bustle of life, uh, the, uh, the um, attractions of life, um, pleasurable uh, attractions that, 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 that enchant your senses. Some people call happiness, some, you know how people define happiness usually? Satisfaction or satisfaction of their senses. The eyes, beautiful. Ears, pleasant taste. It's all satisfaction or the stimulation of their senses. And they call that happiness. Is it right? Happiness lies in peace of mind. It does not matter about your senses. Senses, satisfaction of senses is very short term. You have to look at the peace of mind. And that peace of mind, you have to look at within. So that's the reason why we're meditating. Okay? Now, given all that, that's to, to work at it. But then, we, have, we don't have that much time. People are so busy. Um, no, how can you meditate for so many hours per day? So you don't have that kind of training. And at a junk, when we died, you just roll into the next life again with your karma. Your good karma, your bad karma, your neutral karma. You roll into the next life, to the next life and death again. So the, Bu the Buddha was so sympathetic with sentient beings when they're so busy with their lives that they don't have time to practice. And he brought out this heaven concept 
that nobody knew about at that time, they brought out, there's a land called Amitabha Buddha's land. And at the juncture of death, if you're not successful in your enlightenment, go to that land. Because in that land, you won't reach to grasp to life and death. When you go to that land, you will be under the instructions and the patronage of the Buddha, of Bodhisattva, of Arahats, of all these saintly people, and they will be your teacher, and they teach you meditation, and you don't have time for, you don't have time for TV, you don't have time for cell phone, you don't have time for movies, you don't have time to go to parties and all that, and karaoke, you, you wouldn't do anything like that. Those are too polluted for you. When you are there, you learn to the, the enlightenment, how to practice until you get an enlightenment. You have to go to that land because you have no option because you're not successful in this life. So you've got to go to that land to continue your exploration, to continue your spiritual odyssey, to go to that, to that nirvana, get away from life and death. And that's the heavenly concept. There's so many ways in the Buddhist teaching. And let's carry on this heavenly concept. Let's read. And again, O oh Sariputra, that world, Sugavati, is adorned with seven terraces, with seven rows of palm trees and with strings of bells. It is enclosed on every side, beautiful, brilliant, with the four germs, gold, silver, beryl, and crystal, with such arrays of excellences peculiar to a Buddha country is that Buddha country adorned. This is a description of that land, a description of heaven. The Buddha on this sutra gives a very detailed description as to how that land looks like. That land has all the germs and beautiful palm trees, seven rows and seven terraces. Why seven? I mean, seven is a very magical number. Because in Buddhism, there is the 37 age of enlightenment. 37 enlightenment consists of seven categories of these. Now these embraces contain all the practices. So seven is a very magical figure. The Buddha gave seven categories of all these aids to enlightenment. The four meditations, the four right efforts, the four requisites for obtaining supernatural powers, the five spiritual faculties, the five spiritual powers, the seven limbs of enlightenment, and the noble eightfold path. So if you ask, can you give us a syllabus, everything that contains the Buddhist teaching, especially in the Theravada school, that is it, the seven requisites of enlightenment. Many, in, in many Theravada school, in Thailand, in Burma, um, these are the seven, 37 requisites to enlightenment. If you study each one of these, the Theravada school is very compact and is simpler than the Mahayana. Mahayana has a lot of volumes, 8,600 volumes. But this Hinayana, the Theravada, contains very compact 37 aids to enlightenment. If you follow every one of these, you get into enlightenment. And this is a lifetime. The whole lifetime is devoted to studying, practice these 37 requisites to enlightenment. In your spare time, if you have time, um, you get into the computer, internet, uh, try to find out the 37 requisites to enlightenment. It contains detail as to how to do it. Um, and because now, right now, I'm explaining the Sutra and Amitabha Buddha. And I cannot spend all the time explaining this, explaining this 37 age to enlightenment because that would take a few months because you do it step by step, how to do the four meditations, how to do the four right endeavors, the four requisites for obtaining supernatural powers. All these require a lot of time in expla explaining it. However, because in the sutra it says seven of these, seven palm trees, seven terraces, and some people say, well, why always mention seven? Seven is something, is, is a whole combination, six categories, uh, seven categories. It, it symbolizes the seven categories, categories that contain all the Buddhist teaching. Now, 
I won't go into details of each, but I think it's important that you should know some topics of this so that you know what's contained, for example, in the four meditation, what is in the four meditations, say, for example. What is in the four meditations? You meditate the bodies as impure, feelings as sufferings, mental thoughts as changing uh, instantaneously, and phenomena is selfless. So this is just a very, very general outline on the four meditations. The body is impure. Meditate on the body is impure. If you meditate on the body as impure, there are nine methods in meditating the body is impure. We always have these sexual desires in our mind. And some people, this kind of desires in some people are much stronger in other people. Everyone is different. Because some are so involved with it, they get addicted to it. And the, the, the Buddha gave the nine methods to get rid of this sensuous uh, desires. Uh, in other words, relationship between men and women. So, how to get rid of it? Especially monks, monks and nuns. They have to meditate on impurity of body to get rid of that sexual desire. It's the sexual desires that get us into trouble. Most, almost 95% of the people of sentient beings think that sex is good. But that's the culprit. That's the, that's the main reason for life and death. That creates a lot of problem. But we think that is good. It's a topsy-turvy idea. Uh, the Buddha pointed out to us and tell us that get rid, of, get rid of those. How to do it is very difficult. You have to practice the nine methods. So, bodies are impure. It contains a lot of detail. It contains, contains books about how to practice meditation on impurity. Well, once you master that meditation on impurity, that idea won't come up to you anymore. When that idea doesn't come up to you anymore, and you become so sane, you, when you become so sane, you are easy on your way to spiritual enlightenment. So, some high-level monks said, for laymen and laywomen, if you have a family, if you have relationship between a man and a woman, how can you be successful in getting out from the world of desires? You meditate every day, and you perform uh, the sexual behavior, you're involved with it again. In other words, you take a medicine and you take poison. Medicine one day, poison another day, medicine one day, poison another day. How can you be successful in your enlightenment? So the purity comes when you are celibate, when you get rid of all that. You don't need it. You don't need it, but people get addicted to it. So that's the four meditation. It teaches you all, all the methods in there. We, have, we still have to go through the four meditations. And then you meditate on, the, on, on feelings. Feelings contains pleasurable feelings, unpleasurable feelings, and neutral feelings. And mental thoughts, um, fleeting thoughts, impermanence, phenomena of selfness, uh, without self, without an ego, elimination of ego. So all these contain all these contains on elimination of the ego concept. So that's the four meditations. I don't want to go into details. And then the four right endeavors. What are the four right endeavors? To get rid of existing evil deeds. The method of getting rid of all the bad deeds, the bad behavior, bad speech that you have, you're creating now. To get rid of the old existing evil deeds, to get rid of your, your, your behavior, bad behavior, and to prevent evil deeds from arising. To start wholesome deeds and to develop existing wholesome deeds. So there's the difference. Get rid of the bad things, prevent it, prevent it from hap happen, start good things, and continue to develop good things. So these are the four right endeavors but every one of this item contains details. I'm just giving you the topic so that you know what's involved in there. 
And then the four requisites for concentration on desire towards achieving dhyana. Dhyana is jhana in the state of mind that is achieving peace of mind. The peace of mind have different steps, different levels of concentration. So concentration of desire towards achieving dhyana. Concentration of energy towards achieving dhyana. Concentration of investigation towards achieving dhyana. Concentration of analysis towards achieving dhyana. The first three powers are specially required for samadhi. The last power is required for vipassana. So that you really have to study samadhi and vipassana. The continuous attention to the object stabilizes the mind in concentration and bring into being the zamatha state while the contemplation of the object in terms of its qualities and characteristics brings into being the vipassana state. So that means you have to concentrate. If you want to get samatha, you have to practice samadhi and vipassana. Now all these, I'm just giving you the topics. Every one of these contain details in the Theravada school. Uh, so you have to research more into it. There's a lot to study in Buddhism, you know. But if you can master this, this 37 requisites of enlightenment and remember the main ideas you get into it, then you know the wonders of the Buddha's teaching. It's not just blind faith. I believe in the Buddha and that is it. I believe the Buddha would, would forgive me for all my sins. If the, if, if the sins will be eliminated by the Buddha for forgiving you, Buddha has forgiven everyone already, so there's no suffering. You see the logic behind? You have to change your sin by your own efforts, not just relying on other, on a God to eliminate your sins for you. He can only give you the guidance. Your teacher cannot write the examination for you. Your teacher cannot study for you. You have to study it yourself. You have to write the examination yourself. But the teacher can guide you, make sure you, you finished it, make sure you get an A. And then the five spiritual faculties. What is in the five spiritual faculties? Strong faith, strong energy, strong mindfulness, strong concentration, and strong wisdom. So every one of these, you need to understand it in order to know the five spiritual faculties. And then the next is the five spiritual powers. So it's the same faith, energy, mindfulness, tranquility, and wisdom. It's just the level has increased. The level has increased higher and higher and higher. You're going from, although it's the same faith, same energy, mindfulness, tranquility, and wisdom, your, your state of mind is much higher. So this is a matter of degree and magnitude. And then the seven limbs of enlightenment factors, mindfulness, investigation, energy, joy, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. So these are the, the seven enlightenment factors or the limbs, the seven limbs to enlightenment. And one of the noble eightfold path, right view, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And the first three, right view, right thought, and right speech pertains to wisdom. Right action, right livelihood, and right efforts pertains to morality, the precepts, the sila. Right mindfulness and right concentration pertains to meditation, to dhyana. So this is the 37 aids to enlightenment. And some people were asked in that paragraph, why, why seven? Seven, because the whole Theravada school contains the seven categories. Uh, the first category contains four, the second category contains four meditation, four right efforts, four prerequisites for obtaining supernatural power, and then five spiritual faculties, five spiritual powers, seven limbs of enlightenment, 
and the Lobo 84 PAB. If you add this 444557 and 8 together, you got 37, but it's in seven categories. So seven is usually the symbolizes a very important comprehensive structure of the Theravada school of Buddhism. Uh, today I finished one paragraph, um, but it's better to go in detail than just hurry through it. Um, it's really worth your time to explore into the 37 aids of enlightenment. Um, each one, try to remember each one. Um, each one is extremely important. Like the first one, the four meditation, the first one is how to practice meditation in controlling your desire, your sexual desire through meditation of impurity. That's extremely important. Otherwise, you'll be addicted to sensual pleasures. And if you are addicted to sensual pleasures, you can never get to enlightenment. All right, today I finished that paragraph and I already brought out to you the main structure of the Theravada school in the 37 records of an enlightenment. Explore into each one yourself. Uh, maybe in the future, if I lecture on the 37 Age of Enlightenment, then we go into detail in everyone. Uh, but you need to know the framework, and that's the framework to it. And that paragraph also contains all the adornments of heaven, of the land of bliss. Um, the sutra gives a very detail on how that heaven looks like. That heaven has a lot of, um, I wouldn't call them luxuries, because when you say luxuries, that means you are, you are addicted to luxuries. It contains all the good stuff, <laughs> we'll call it this way. On what is God? What, what's the meaning of God? God is simply symbolizes, God is simply goodness personified. We call God as a person. It's God is goodness. The God, God is not a person. It's a, it's a goodness personified for you. God is within you. That kingdom of God is within you, not another God that you have to look for. Like in the Bible, if you read the Bible in detail, if you really understand the philosophy of the Bible, what does the Bible say? Blessed are the pure in mind. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What's that meaning? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The pure in heart, that means the pure in your mind, not your, your physical muscles of heart, not that blood, Heart does not mean that, that little muscles. Heart is your mind. Blessed are, are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Why? Because if they are pure in their mind, they shall see internally their own kingdom of God internally. Don't look for another God outside. No. Inside of you. Don't rely on God. Don't rely on God to make things happen for you. Rely on yourself in everything. Rely on yourself. God, if you think really there's a God, is goodness personified for you. And Buddha is just a teacher. He's a good, he's a teacher. Jesus is a teacher. He just personifies his deeds by, on the, by being nailed to the cross that means he's practicing forgiveness and endurances. You have to see what the Bible means. Don't take the superficial words. Go to the hidden meaning of the Bible. For that reason, we never, never say the Bible is not better than Buddhism. Why do you discriminate the Bible? You are a Buddhist and you discriminate the Bible. The problem comes with your discrimination, not the Bible.